Uh, our next presenter has arrived, Mr. Michael Hill, who is the CEO and President of the Atlanta Metropolitan Black Chamber of Commerce. He is going to come before us this morning and share some information concerning the state of black businesses here in Atlanta. And so we're thankful that uh, he is now here. He is ready uh, to make his presentation. And you give him a round of applause uh, as he comes and uh, share this important information. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, let me apologize for my tardiness. Uh, Pastor Rice said, where are you? I said, I'm in, I'm in Stone Mountain, I'm leaving Gwinnett. Um, I didn't realize the meeting was going to progress as it did, and I, I realized we're in a, a new administration, um, Dr. Brown, and uh, we appreciate you guys always inviting the chamber out. What I wanted to do this morning is to kind of review some things we talked about last year, because I think it's very important that we looked at where, where we are a year from now. But more importantly, I want to give some solutions and suggestions in terms of some things that we need to consider as a clergy and as a community, and particularly a business community. Um, much has not changed uh, since the last time we spoke in terms of the state of black business, but I want to talk about more what can we do as a congregation, a business, and a community. Uh, first of all, for those who are not familiar with the Atlanta Merch Palm Black Chamber of Commerce, we were founded in 2005. And we founded ourselves based on a need, a need to really bring about change and research the issues, not just from a social point of view, but an economic point of view. And um, my wife happens to be working on a uh, Black History Month with our church now, and uh, she's looking at history and she's getting, she's, you know, I told her, I said, well, let's look at the economic side of things, and she's looking at um, uh, before the civil rights, pre-civil rights, then post-civil rights, and she was like, wow. We're so far behind, so far behind. Let's look a little bit of why. Well, the chamber, we primarily exist, we got a new mantra this year. And our mantra this year is that we exist to create opportunities for our members to help them improve the quality of life in their community. Our community needs jobs. We had over 200 and something churches that have been closed over the last two years. That has never happened before in the black church community. And that's really attributed to the lack of jobs that exist within those congregations. And what I really want to challenge our ministers to do this year is to really, let's focus on the economic solutions and let's look at the economic history of what has not been happening within our community. I was looking back and uh, I was looking where George um, Booker T. Washington came to Atlanta in 1895 and he spoke to the Southern Cotton Farmers Expo. And he spoke with thousands of, of individuals. And I, 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 I couldn't imagine that scene. I said, okay, now, these were white, confederate, former slave owners. And he was speaking to thousands of these individuals. And he told them to drop their bucket, cast their bucket down. Cast your bucket down in your community and embrace the African-American Negro at that time. So he really provided them with a formula in terms of what they needed to do in terms of gaining control of their community, in terms of interacting with the African American. Wow. That bucket is still being cast down each and every single time, but we're not casting our own buckets down. When we look at the economic situation, this is post-World War, and I'm going to have this information, I'm going to move through it quickly for the sake of time. But when we look at the recessionary periods, which you guys have seen, I really want you guys to follow the economic history and what was going on in, in the black community during this time. But wealth disparity in our community. We're losing wealth at a record rate. We've never, as a community, really obtained wealth. That's right. True wealth. That's right. Our last chance of really, really, really having an opportunity to seize wealth, look at us in the late 1800s and 1900s, wow. when we were coming out of the Civil War. Our net worth as a community, yeah, we're a $1 trillion market base. They keep telling us about how we're great consumers. But if you look at our net worth as a people, if you look at the gross domestic product, if you compare it to the nation, say, oh, you'll be ranked ninth in the world in terms of consumers. But our wealth, our contribution to the America is less than 1.2%. Unchanged since 1865. What? Unchanged net worth, our contribution of wealth to the United States of America is less than 1.2% unchanged since 1865. What have we learned with this presidency? Me as a black man, I've seen a brother be disrespected. Amen. One of the greatest presidents has done more in his short-term administration than any other person, but he's not getting any credit for it. 
So if this man who has achieved the highest of the highest of the land titles, the highest title that you can get in the United States of America in the world, and you're getting disrespected? I mean, y'all think about that. Think about that as we pursue these titles. And this man, who is the king, I mean, not the king, but the world leader in the United States of America, what have we learned? We learned over the these, these economic times you had in terms of African Americans in 1865, we need to relook at this period. What happened? This was about land resources. This was about controlling natural resources. We need to look at the Industrial Revolution when they created the educational system. We talk about the modern founders of the educational system, but it was, the, it was the Henry Fords, the Rockefellers, and the Vanderbilts that created the educational system. We had to get the farmers to learn how to use these mechanized equipment, so we need to charter schools and create controls so individuals can learn how to be managers and employees, not owners. That's right. That's right. That's right. Not owners. I want you to look for a book called The Underground Educational System. You know how I found out about this book? You remember when Barack Obama came and was speaking to kids about, hey, the education, you know, I want you to get great education. They got all upset. Conservative talk radio went crazy. I want you to read this book. It's called The Underground Education System. Very interesting book. And it talks about how the Industrial Revolution, Industrial Revolutionary leaders have controlled the educational system. Our Vanderbilt's, our Stanford's. Rockefeller said the best investment that he made was in Chicago University. This is what's training our mindsets. Still talking about problems. Now we're moving into the knowledge age. You heard me talk about green and sustainability. The knowledge age is the exact same thing. Things have changed. Each of these economic recessionary periods that I showed you before, companies were created, billions was made. The next one is Facebook. Dirt disturbing report. And I'm on my ministers. I, I got so upset I called Pastor Russ. I want you to hear this. I mean, I had, a, had a brother who um, just got back from Ghana. He said, Mike, let me tell you something. I was just on a trade mission. I started out, went to an organization a group called TAG, which focused in on technology. They found that I had this mechanized equipment which could dry out fruits and vegetables. And China had dropped the ball in Ghana on a product, basically sold the Africans a product they couldn't use. So I got on this trade mission with ministers. And we went over to Ghana. Every religion was there. He looked to his left, he looked to his right. Nobody looked like me and you. But it was ministers representing churches that were going over to Ghana to build and help the, help the needy in Ghana. But he said, I looked to my left and right. I saw a geologist. I saw a scientist. I saw a builder. I saw a constructor. I said, wait a minute, what's going on? Why do I have all this talent right here going over to Ghana? But these ministries are getting land donated to them. In the name of God. See, when we go over there to save souls, they're going over there to sell souls. You understand what I'm saying? So these are churches that are going over there. They don't look like you and I. He said, he saw the Ganesians and said, wait a minute, you're the first black minister we ever seen. So I'm not a minister. But yet we got leaders who are entertaining and seeing international commerce that are going on, but we're not there, you guys. We got all this intelligentsia in our room, and what I challenge you to do in 2012 is to use it. We need to think more, how many veterans we got in here? Y'all heard me say this before, you can't go into war without a plan, right? You got to have maps. You have, you, have to, you have to understand the terrain. These are things that I want you to challenge yourself in terms of looking at stuff from a strategic point of view, knowing that poverty is affecting us, looking at the environmental conditions, looking at the educational levels, looking at the employment, looking at the lifestyle choices. What do you do best? What do you know best? I've spoken to many of you, brilliant people in here. This is the hub of knowledge. But we're still talking about the same issues we was talking about last year and the year before that and 100 years ago. Man. People want to live in healthy communities where they feel safe. My friends chastised me for moving out of Gwinnett County. Why you way out of Well, I lived in the inner city, bro. My, my child got asthma. And now that she lives out in Gwinnett, she don't have asthma. Yeah, my, 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 my wife took us out there thinking that she was going to get a better education. But you know, it was very interesting. I sat down with uh, one of the principals over here at um, 
one of the schools. And he said, okay, Mike, so you done ran out to go in there. Well, that was my wife, she took me out there. You ran out to go in there. And I'm going to show you something. Here go the APS scores. Here go the scores for African American children in the Atlanta Public School System. Here's Gwinnett scores. Yeah, they look good. They, they passed APS and all the you know, testing and so forth. Now let's break it down by race. Black male children are doing worse in Gwinnett than they're doing in APS. Black male females in Gwinnett are doing pretty much the same as they are in APS. But you moved out there. You understand what I'm saying? Mm, absolutely right. Nice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we went to a better environment maybe, but our kids are not getting a better education. Systematic. When we look at our community, we gotta look at the, the safety, we have to look at the resources. These are the things that build up our community. I'm not getting into this. But when we talk about the knowledge economy, the biggest thing and the biggest problem that we have in our community is lack of knowledge. I spoke at a meeting last week, you guys gave me pretty much the same presentation. Very inspiring. And then when I walked out the room, it was very inspiring. I looked back at the last gathering of these men and one woman. And I looked at the average age that was sitting at that table. The youngest person was 65, everybody else was 70 plus. Wow. And I explained to my wife my disheartened, and I said, wow. And they're in there having a strategic plan about something. And I said, you wonder what the, the dichotomy of the black man who is supposed to be the leader of our community and the young black man, that, 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 that tension. You know, it's a tension between the black male and the young black male. That's right. And I attribute it to like the absentee father syndrome, me as a leader. See, I've always yearned to be mentored. So what I had to do, I had to lead myself. I had to figure it out on my own. Yeah. So when I'm in a room with these leaders, who have done great things in their past. I always feel that conflict. And it's like, think about it. You were the absentee father and now your son has grown up. And then when you step in his presence, you expect him to respect you. We got to mentor. We have to mentor. I'm not condemning it, I'm just saying, that's not gonna happen to me. I'm approaching 43, you guys. I am now reaching back. The programs that we do in our organizations have to be relevant, diverse, not just a certain group of kids. We gotta go to the alternative schools and find out what's happening. Not just the, the kids that's going to college. What about those kids who are now in the community? Yeah. Let's talk about plans. Our biggest challenge is our community's lack of over-resources. I talk about the institutional barriers. We talk about the funders. Y'all saw this last time. Mm -hmm. People who are funding our communities, it's just been replaced. It's not corporations. Mm. That's right. That's right. Who's providing your way? As long as you become dependent on other people providing your resources, Amen. you will not get things done. Right. Amen. Two books you need to read. Rebuilding the Inner City. The Careless Society in terms of how they talk about when we allow other people to come in your community and provide, they bring in their individuals and replace you, gentrification. So you're telling me that we know the problems in our community, we know us better than us, and other people can come in and change it around. The trillion dollar consumer base, if we know that these are the things that African Americans consume in these communities, why don't we gain and take control and make sure that we have businesses that represent this footprint? If the United States Census said, one billion spit with a small business can create 500 jobs. Why are we not doing that? You know the statistics. You know the numbers. If we know that every new business, when it enters into our community, it creates a direct impact on jobs. And all of that trickle down. So that's the multiplier effect. Why are we not doing this? We're smart. You know what the problem is? And I thank my pastor when we sat down and talked about this. I said... I got frustrated. My wife said, baby, you gotta understand. You think different. See, your friends and some I went to school with, they thinking about titles. Mm -hmm. right. You think about territory. Right. You see, a title is given, people. Yeah. That's what we talk about now, this poor generation. It was given to them. They don't appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Given. That's a title. It's given to you. But territory, it requires you to think. You have to acquire. 
you have to be strategic. You see, when we look at what happened in 1950 and before, black people was considered focusing on territory. But see, when we got affirmative action and all these handouts and blessings, and it was given, we pursued titles. So let's look at what happened between 18 and 19. We're not doing that, but I want you to research that. 13th Amendment, 1965, Black History Month. 14th Amendment, Border Rights Act, Equal Protection. Then we got a claim. You have more black people going into politics back then than we do now. Black population was highest, was almost at 20% than now. Black wealth was increasing in our communities, and here come the Klan to get us distracted. What do we got now, Obama? Tea Party. Right. So Black History Month, we need to really look at what's been happening in history. Check out the Reconstruction Act. All of this, my elders are sitting in this room understand that. And between 1882 to 1958, they hung over 475 of our black leaders who decided to stand up. That's right. Took them out. Acquired territory, people. We did research. We're right here. Do you know how many churches are in this footprint right here? Black churches. Media. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend, it's over 200 African American churches. We can put one in every single corner. So here's what I'm going to say on close. This is our community. Our community needs improvement. We understand the economic conditions on that. We can read the statistics. I love what Iconia Baptist Church is doing. I love what she said about technology. Very important. Embrace it. So when you're talking about changing this community, we need to look at economic solutions led by the church. This is your next mission. Because your congregation is broke. They broke. The next mission is economics. Invite the chamber to come into your congregation. Let's talk economics. Let's talk about self-empowerment. That's what we got. That's what they talked about pre 1950. But see, we're talking about get some titles. Let's talk about how the church can create entities like community development corporations, and some churches are doing. So it's not like you got to reinvent the wheel. Go look at what Antioch Baptist Church is doing. We got many models throughout the country that you can duplicate and replicate. Talk about starting daycare centers. You would never have another complaint about the educational system right. because you can take those retired grandmothers or those laid off teachers and start daycares and open up the doors of the church and change the mindsets of those communities. Right. I'm not going to say this again. You have to take control of your communities. This is it, y'all. This is an economic solution for you. It's self-empowerment for your community. Daycares, Head Start programs, retired teachers, early childhood, tutorial programs. All these tests, all these teachers that we got who can give y'all the test, teach them the test. Career services. Invite role models to these communities. I showed you, you got over 200 or some churches at every corner. Bring the intelligentsia to your congregation and let the community in so they can hear this. Because they ain't coming back. They scared to come in the community. But if a church called them, guess what will happen? They'll be there. Bring out who's who, you guys. This is something that you can do yourself. Entrepreneur enrichment, community development, these are the things in political education. How the system works. Not just vote, we gotta get beyond vote. That's good. You voted, but now you need to understand that the people that you put in office need to be held accountable. The people you put in office, because it does not make no sense that we got politicians who've been in, in position for 30 years and our community look the same way. Amen. 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 But then saying, the community ain't asked. Right. The community ain't presented no plan. That's right. Because y'all ain't focused on voter registration and y'all ain't presented no proposals. Take John Lewis' proposal. Take your politicians' a proposal. Get involved, you guys. If you're not a member of the Concerned Black Clergy, get involved. Stop sitting here eating breakfast and not doing anything. If the Concerned Black Clergy is not for you, get involved with the Neighborhood Planning Unit. Get involved in something. If it does not exist, you don't like the leadership, create your own. Collaborate. 
And last but not least, social media. This is the solution, you guys. We have created a product called AMBCC.US. If you have a phone, everybody in here got a phone. Sign on to it, it's free. We have identified over 500 something businesses that you can connect with. I would like to, the members of the Concerned Black Clergy to give us their churches so we can connect them to this. Besides, I have a gentleman in our uh, membership right now that's designing a program, which is called, which is going to help the voter registration campaign information. Or you can, it's called Vote Near Me. It's coming out. So what we're doing now, the new community to bring us together is online. Each and every one of you guys are your leaders. I need you to tell your story, just like the, the, the um, 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 yeah. Dr. Ann was saying, each and every single one of you guys are leaders. Put that message, videotape what she's saying, capture the message of our elders and record that so they can be viewed online forever. And, and make it viral, you guys. About time. This is Black History Month, and we can make a difference. So, thank you guys. I didn't have time to show you this, but I definitely want to invite you out on February the 15th. February the 15th, led by Pastor Wright, uh, we're holding a, a meeting called Transformative Leadership Circle. And for those people who are ready to do something different, I want to invite you, the Concerned Black Clergy, and other leaders to come out. Joe Beasley, Wealth of Information. And he understands what I'm talking about with what these churches are doing globally, because he's doing it. So we got brilliant models in here, you guys. All I ask you to do is look to your left, look to your right. Sit down, educate, and train the next generation. Thank you for your time. God bless you. And have a blessed day. Questions that we have. Questions that we have. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He's got to have his own seminar. <laughs> okay. Yes. February fifteenth. <laughs> it's not really a question. You mentioned February fifteenth. Uh, if you're interested in coming, uh, tell us where and what time, and is there a fee? That's the right. Or are you here? He's outside. Okay. Uh, it's going to be at the um, the Sheraton Hotel Airport. And if you, um, there's two ways you can do this. You, if you um, just ask Pastor, Pastor Wright, you probably point of contact. He'll be probably the best person to, to get that. Michael Wright. Number two. Mm -hmm. uh, my distinguished brother. Good to see you again. Mine is a question. All right, Michael. This is our dog. Name is Michael. Uh, are you a member of the same Black Clergy? <laughs> yes, I am. I need to. 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 I need the generation and the understanding of language. We have a different language. Mm -hmm. And I did not hear you address that, but I'm sure you have, that you deal with those who, who deal with technology, deal with those who went to school, those who have assimilated to somebody else's culture. But in my experience when I was in Kenya and looking at the Maasai tribe, and they have cattle as the definition of wealth. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure how we define wealth here and how we reconnect with our culture of the elders, the black male, and how we can address the women being the majority of the churches that you are targeted, and how you are looking at the role of how to get the black male back engaged and help them solve the problem. I think, I think, I think you got, I think Akonia Baptist Church is doing a great job. They're having a conversation that's, that's going over generations. It's best practices. Look at those organizations and groups that are doing great things and invite them into your congregation. It's also about strategy. You have a map. You have 200 and something churches in a geographical location. Get out and do outreach with those churches. Find out what they're doing. Start doing research on those churches. This should be a research hub. Knowing what's statistically happening with churches. When I go to your website, I should be able to pull documentation and research. You should be viewed as an authority for people who are visiting your website. So then what happens now is that they have to go through you 
in order to get access to the community. But we must first take control of our community. It's just like how they send champions in our communities. Maybe it's not you, maybe it's not me, to go talk to the brother that's hustling down the street. But if I have mentored him, or I have mentored his family, or I have reached his family by simply, this is what I'm saying, starting with educating, truly opening the doors of the church. If you truly open the doors of the church, if you start mentoring programs and stuff like just imagine each church doing that. But see, there has to be a, 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 a central conduit that's really educating them and making that happen, like the concerned black clergy. That's simply what I'm saying to the concerned black clergy. If I put a flag in the ground right here, I got 200 churches that are in a five mile radius of here. We need to sit down with each of those churches, one, examine what they're doing. I need to be able to access them on the Concerned Black Clergy's website. You understand what I'm saying? And then they are now filling apart, whether they're connected or not. But the value is, is that I can access those churches from the Concerned Black Clergy. They are now affiliated with the Concerned Black Clergy. And then this Concerned Black Clergy can then now hold those pastors accountable. We got a lack of accountability in our community. And I'm saying that through social media now, we can connect. And we use these times like Black History Month um, and any other type of anniversary to connect and have these discussions. So a generation conversation needs to be happening right now at every church, period. Number four. Okay, can I ask? Uh, my name is Jonathan Walsh. Mm. I'm the question would be, I heard what you were sharing with us, and it seems that Coming in, the same that if we found a way that we could connect everybody, at least on one, on one idea, while the idea that everybody has now stay in place and be done because they're criminal, but find a way to focus on the self fund and participate, that might be an idea to bring together some of the things that you were sharing. Like you said, you got the information. But now you need a plan of implementation to make it work for everybody. And uh, I guess that's, that's both a comment and of course, do you see a way to do this? Yes, and that's what we're discussing on uh, February the 15th. Yes, I do. Okay. Number five. We can talk out here with you. My name is Flint King, aka Game Ward. Uh, these 501 C3s, that's been a big problem why my people can't say what they need to say to us because they're in sign that's true. signing. The, you know, they're going to sign off to the government, not to say what they're supposed to say to us. The hair care products, yes, sir. eight what, eight billion yeah. a year? Nine, what they billion. Nine billion. Nine billion. Ninety-eight percent. That's a shame before women. God. And like you said, the church is the one that got to straighten this up. The church got to bring us in because that's why all the folk that still do own businesses, they're do right you, in the church. Do you understand right why, the church. Church, why the church is the church is the only? place that we still have a solid infrastructure in our right. Absolutely. It's right. the last thing. Absolutely. And you have to be very careful with this government face-based program because now, right. unlike any other other uh, institution, y'all the last stand in terms of really accepting government funding. Y'all have been self-sufficient by yourself. When the church decides they want to do something, they can do it with five, tens, and twenties. But the moment you start opening your doors to the government, Amen. that's right. That's what's happening. You're the last stand, Charlie. My last statement, my last statement. The difference in us in every other race and why the entrepreneurs uh, our ministries work and ours don't. We're the only race of people on earth that don't love each other, don't trust each other, and don't feel God. It's us, y'all. So we got to manufacture love. Like or imitate love or if you give enough incentive. We can do just what he said we're going to do. I'm jumping, and that's why I came today, dealing with entrepreneurship and um. We got to make a change. We got to show these people exactly what we made of. We're going to get this billion dollars a year and keep it among us and take nothing to stop us other people when we do that. And y'all know that. And it's going to happen this year. All That's right. right. All you got to do is open Six. Six. Yeah. How can we know unless we have a teacher? And how can we have a teacher unless one be sent? Can you hear you? How can we have a teacher unless one be sent? He has been sent. You know, 1555 to 1980 was 430 years. That was the sojourn of the children of Israel in Egypt. Minister Farrakhan did the most important lecture ever done right in this city right here. Who are the real children of Israel? And it's us. 
We are that. The Jews, I mean, everybody know the Masonics, the, the Shriners, they know that that's not talking about them or the Jews. Mason means Muslim sign. Shriner is a shrine, a tomb of a once great deity that people worship. And that tomb that they worship was us before we were killed over here in America. Harold McBeth knocked in the head. Now it's time for us to come up. In my conclusion, Minister Farrakhan at Savior's Day, you got to hear www.noi.org. You got to hear his lecture. He's going to ask us, later for them, give me five cents. Give me five cents from each black man in America. Don't you trust me? That's what he's going to ask us. And if you trust me, give me five cents and you watch what I'm going to do with it. We're going into agribusiness. We got to get back to the land. Because when this economy falls and this doesn't fail, we're going to have to feed ourselves. All of this, that dollar ain't worth nothing. It ain't going to be worth nothing. But God is waiting for us to stand up like it was with the children of Israel. Only when they decide to get behind Moses and they really came out of there, not so much physically. This is our promised land. We built this. When, it's, when we decide to come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of our sin, that God is going to raise us, but we're going to have to do it through a man that God has ordained for us. And until we do that, all that we talk about it's good, but it's going to destroy the destiny of our children. Right. Thank you. Right. Number seven. Number seven. Um, you know, there's a, we have the, the Georgia Black Chamber of Commerce, the, the, the Atlanta and the Lithonia and the different chambers. I was wondering, is there something that comes out with, like, an agenda for, like, what the focus points are going to be? Because there has to be some type of union with the, like he was saying about the union of what the focal points are so we can reach more people. So is there something that you guys do collectively to be able to reach more people in a focused area? Yeah, or I think that is uh, not. They're working on it. No. And um, it's been a, it's been a, you know, it's been a seven year journey for me that I know now this is probably going to be my last term uh, because I am going to pursue a, another direction. But I think I think with AMDC, with the launch of AMDCC US, what we have figured out, and just kind of like if, if you look at when we went from this side of the room and as we go on from this one, we have many diverse issues, suggestions, opinions, uh, points of view, and, and, and it's diverse. And that's been always the challenge. I mean, when we came over here, I mean, we were put together as a people from different tribes. Okay? Um, so, so with that, with that knowledge is that that's why social media, I mean, we're going to do everything that we can to put us together socially on the internet, but period. As, as a group, though, as the chambers of commerce, as because that, no. that, okay, because no. that has okay. to be what no. we collect. No, but you know what that is? It, it, whichever organization you are part of, it's up to you as a member of that organization right. to demand that they come together. Yeah. They don't want to do it, though. You, you listen to what I'm saying? No, no, listen to what I'm saying. I've said it many times. If you are part of a fraternity, a sorority, an organization, a group, a synagogue, whatever that is, it's you, your leadership within there as a member to demand from your leaders to come together. It's hard, isn't it? See? Number eight. That's your responsibility as a member. I'm with it. But I'm just one person. I'm a lady. Jimmy. 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 Jimmy
about that particular thing, disrespect the United States of America and yourself? Uh, I think what we have to do is we have to look at what, what tactics and techniques that other groups have used. We have to do a self-examination of what we are doing in terms of response to it. Because when we have a, a conservative right that is taking media time, and that's all, I mean, that's a minority group. I still haven't heard anything from our groups, you know what I'm saying, as it relates to the president, because I think we tend to say, well, if the black folks get up, then they'll look at the president too black. So it's like, kind of like we pigeonhole. So what we can do quietly among ourselves is to really begin looking, taking a, a good look in the mirror, a look within, and just like I was sharing with um, this sister right here, is that we have to, every single one of you are empowered to hold whatever group or organization accountable. If we're not coming together as an organization, ask the leadership of where you are. Why y'all not working with this group or that group? That hasn't even been asked. That hasn't even been challenged. You will sit here and say, accept what the leader tells you. You will sit here and listen to what the pastor says every day. That's one of the things. That's why I went from a, a mega church to a small church because I felt that my pastor was not listening to me. I had to get permission to set up an appointment to talk to my pastor. I got a problem with that, okay? I'm sitting there every Sunday hearing a word that I can't even feel it. You understand what I'm saying? Because it didn't apply to me. So now I'm a part of a church where I, I sat down and I said, listen, I need spiritual guidance because I need to become more connected with God. But then also, I have, a, I, have a, I have some things that need to be said and my pastor listens to me and it is preached on Sunday morning. So, so that's a powerful thing. So what, I'm, what we're talking about today is let's, take the, let's go back and look at the church from an economic positioning point of view. And really what I'm saying about the black church listening because they broke is what I'm saying is that I have some economic solutions for you black church. I have some solutions that gonna, that's going to change the social problems in our community black church. All I need you to do, black church, is to open up your doors and look within. First, make an assessment of your congregation's talent. As you have assessed your congregation's talent, let's start by educating our kids. Let's start by bringing our elders in so they can hear the stories, so they can learn. Now, mentoring. I ain't got to join none of these mentoring groups of big brothers, big sisters. They can be done in the church. That's what I'm asking the church to do. And I'm going to find me 100 churches in my journey. Because this is the kickoff. That are going to do it. And then I'm going to come back next year. I'm going to say, these are the churches that joined on. Oh, y'all, you know, y'all continue to. But listen, you guys, we've got to change how we're doing things. And I'm saying that the new community is online. And we got to embrace that. And for my elders who are scared of it, go get with your granddaughters and your grandchildren. Let them do it for you. You just sit there and they, let them type it and you speak it. Let them record you so it can go viral because... I want to preserve y'all history, y'all. We losing y'all. Thank you. Y'all about the transition, and I don't know nothing. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? I need to know what it was like back then. You understand what I'm saying? We need to document that information. And the church, our last infrastructure, our last solid infrastructure needs to lead on this. And this is what I'm saying. I will bring the business community. I need you guys to do what you're good at doing. It's like they told me a long time ago. Best marriage advice I got. Whoever does it best. Doesn't. Yeah. Number nine. Thank you. Uh, just a few observations. Um, one of the things we did several years ago was encourage a black bank then, if I remember correctly. Um, maybe it was 10 years ago. Uh, we discovered here in Atlanta that uh, black churches banked about $26 million a week, which was $8 billion a year. At that time, we had four black banks, and those four black banks got 2% of that amount of money. And I would hope that we would start again a campaign to put our monies in the black bank, because, you know, where your money is, that's what talks. Who was around during that time, and what he's talking about? Raise your hand. I had my shirt on too. All right, so, so, so with that, the best thing that you guys can do is go back, pull that history together, Look at how they did that. Put an assessment. Walk down to Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse, Spelman, whatever. Have them do some documentation on it. And put it in a paper. And put it out there. You same gentlemen and women who lived during that time, during Black History Month, have a panel discussion on that. Tour that from those 200 different churches that are in our community that are reaching different diverse groups of African-American sex. 
See, we keep letting other people write our history. That's right. The most powerful people out there right now are researchers and marketers. Because right. somebody in a corporation got together in the boardroom and said, hey man, I need to do a statistical study on this particular thing, to prove this particular thing. Well, let's take it down to Harvard. Harvard now releases a, a report on mm -hmm. such and such is good for you or bad for you. And then it goes into the media, then the marketers take advantage of it, then they commercialize it and make money off of us. You gotta understand that. We need to, once again, the organizations and groups that we are members of, we have to ask more of them and hold them accountable. The other thing I want to observe, when I grew up, it was the Jews who had their own stores in our black mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Now it's the Asians. Yeah. And, the Jews sold it today. Yeah, and we, I grew up in a climate where we're almost in, in us that you know, black doctors and dentists were not but somehow inferior, and that, that was the thing we had to deal with. And the other thing I want to make an observation is, I think somewhere about a couple of months ago, I heard that, that the total amount that we as black people spend in this nation, mm -hmm. if we were a nation, we would have the seventh total gross GP in the world. Mm -hmm. Now that means we're spending a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. If it's all kept within our community as nation just think about that now the seventh largest GP in the world now that that's more than many of the nations in the world have so somehow we've got to unite ourselves and 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 start spending our money in our community and Whatever it takes, I don't, and I don't know how we can do it, but I think we need to, as part of Concerned Black Clergy, maybe it's, it's education. Political-wise, I think we can, we can help out. Some time ago it was suggested that we do a form letter, pass it to our pastors, and let the pastors duplicate those letters and mail them to our state representatives, our state senators, with regard to the proposal that President Obama has prepared, uh, I would like to see some follow-up on that. So these are a couple of things that I, I wanted to uh, just share with you. Now, when we built this building, it was supposed to be a daycare center. Mm -hmm. They told us we had, to, we had to set back 30 feet from the sidewalk in order to, and so we had to abandon that because that was, to me, something that I did not feel we could do it at that time. All right. So I'm just saying that I think we need to get together. We got a, a tremendous history behind us. And if, if we all didn't know anything about black history, we got inventors, we got educators, we got a history behind us that yeah. just doesn't go back as far as our African American history. But yeah. if you study biblical history, all those black, all those folk back there in the Old Testament was us. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I am Pastor Virginia Ramsey. The loudest. I am the pastor. I am Pastor Virginia Ramsey, the pastor of the Church of the Resurrection. I um, am sitting here listening, and I'm speaking to the disrespect of President Obama. All right. Once President Obama became president, the very next day they started disrespecting him by calling him Mr. Obama. All right. That was the time for us to come together. Yeah. But now that we are coming together and trying to empower ourselves to deal with the situation, we need to empower ourselves, but we need to also think about how the Jews and the Pharisees done Christ when he was here on earth, how they disrespected him. They are disrespecting President Obama in the same vein. Now is the time for us not only to empower ourselves to deal with this situation, but to go on bending knees and talk to God for direction. Amen. 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 I told you this now. You guys, um, we really have to practice next steps. One thing about our community, we are a resilient people, and it's been proven over and over again. And we're very impassioned people and we are very angry sometimes with, with some of the things that have not been done for us. 
Um, I got some real powerful uh, uh, things that we got to really think about. And what I want to leave you with is that, you know, um, it was an episode of Shark Tank that a guy was sharing it with me. It's the guy, he was, he was start bent on really doing a product based to create American jobs. He was very, very passionate. He was trying to convince him, well, you can't do this. You may need to think about this. You got to be thinking about this. But he was passionate about American jobs. Just like we are passionate about black America. But he said something very powerful to the gentleman. I want you guys to think about this, and I'm thinking about it too, because when I started this organization, it was about passion. But then I said, wait a minute, you know what? We gotta do something different because the passion is not being heard. We gotta really have a plan, okay, and a plan of action. So I say this to you, we gotta first make it. Once you make it, you gotta master it. Once you master it, you gotta multiply it. Then it matters. You understand that? You gotta make it master it, multiply it, then it matters. We lead what matters. And nobody don't really, they don't hear you because it don't matter to them. But when you make it, and you master it, and you multiplying that success and just duplicating all of it, oh yeah, it matters now, they're listening. So keep that in mind. Make it, master it, multiply it, now it matters. Thank you.